Okay, one second. Today I'm going to try new method instead of jumping all the time from my computer, from my iPad to my iPad. I'm going to try to be like Paul. Okay, can you see this? Everyone can see this? Is it visible? Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I'm projecting from my iPad out. So I learned this from, from Paul that you can, that you can, that it's convenient to have the, the slides in the iPad so you can write also on them. So, okay, today I'll, okay, the purpose of, of the, my talk today is to get precisely to the question, to, to get an answer to the question that was posed to, to in the last talk. What do you do with the singularities in the case of CP2? Okay, CP2 is a toric manifold. It's the toric manifold who has a, which has a Dalsan polyto with them, uh, which is just a triangle, is the example we saw yesterday. Okay, and then in this case, of course, when you get to the boundaries of the triangle, of the Dalsan triangle, you are going to get some singularities in the picture. The good news is that these singularities are under control. These singularities are of non-degenerate type. How do we know this? We know this thanks to a theorem by, by Gilamin, uh, the, well, Gilamin mar, uh, local normal form for, for torus, for action of torus. Well, it, it started with an action of S1, but you can generalize it for, for actions of torus, okay? then you know that on the boundary, the kind of singularities you are going to have corresponds to elliptic singularities in the classification I showed yesterday, okay? So the purpose of, of today's talk is to get to that point. But before getting to that point, we also need to understand what, uh, if, if you, what happens if you have a regular fiber. Does it contribute to, to, the, to quantization or not? And for that, I first need to give this definition of quantization that I will use, which is the one of Coston. There is a lot of intersection of what I'm going to say with what Cota said uh, in the previous uh, hour, okay? Uh, but maybe I'll stop to make some of the proofs that Cota didn't do, or maybe not. Well, we'll see, because usually I, I tend to go over time. I don't want to do this today. Okay, so that's the purpose. Let's go back to the initial picture, to this love a story uh, where we are. We are classical systems and we got, want to get to quantum systems. And today in, the, in this scheme that we had yesterday where the second and the fourth point were not highlighted, they were in, in gray, okay? Now I really want to focus on, on this idea, on, on the existence of a connection. So when I have a, uh, when I consider uh, geometric quantization, the ingredients are symplectic manifold, we have this under control. We have this condition of, inter of interality that already Kota uh, describes very nicely because uh, you can identify indeed the, because omega is going to be the curvature of your connection, you can really identify this class as the up to constant. Okay, as the churn class of the line bundle. Okay, so you can identify this. We saw this indeed well, up to details because you usually normalize. Okay, this depends on your normalization. I mean, if you if you believe that pi equals one, well, you understand what I say, right? So, and, and that's and that's a very an, an important feature. Like once you identify this integral class as the churn class. Okay, then it becomes, uh, then it's integer. Indeed, and, and the reason why it's integer is because you are con really considering an Hermitian line bundle. Okay, I, I plan to go this in a minute. Another important feature that you need is a real polarization. Okay, why? Because indeed, initially, what you would like to do is to take uh, flat sections. In, in the case, uh, in the in Keller case, you would consider homomorphic sections. Now we are considering the case 
in which I have a real polarization. Okay, so I want to consider I have I have a bundle, I have a line bundle over my manifold, and I want to consider sections of this bundle. Okay, and I want to consider uh, sections of this bundle. Uh, of course, I have the curvature. Curvature here appears as an abstraction to have global sections of this bundle. That's the point. So I may consider solutions to this equation. And this is the flat section equation. And then you impose that this is equal to zero only in the directions, in the directions of the polarization. That's the equation you want to consider. Still, maybe you will not have global sections and it's normal because of the curvature constraint. I mean, if you are in the, uh, if you are in the cotangent bundle, then this is another story. But if you are compact, this becomes an abstraction, okay? To global existence. We are going to see this in a minute. But the connection to yesterday talk, to yesterday talks and the, the, the problem session is precisely that our point of view is that, what do you take as real polarization? We are going to take an integrable system. Integrable systems though have the problem that if you have an integrable system on a compact manifold, you will have singularities for sure because of the maximum principle. And okay, what I want to explain today is that if these singularities are non-degenerate, you can still, well, you define what is a generalized po uh, polarization just by including these singularities in the picture. Okay, these singularities in the picture you can look at them in two ways. You can, uh, this is something that I was explaining yesterday in the, in, the, in the regular case, in the regular case, the fiber, the fiber of your integrable system and precisely uh, the, the orbit of the distribution defined by the Hamiltonian vector fields, but all the Hamiltonian vector fields of your integrable system coincides. This happens because magic happens when you have a Lagrangian leaf. This doesn't happen when you go to a singularity. When you go to a singularity, the, you, you, you may have a fiber and the fiber doesn't coincide with the orbit. Trivial example of this. I'm going to take, I take this, uh, this uh, singularity here, well, I'm not drawing very well. Let me do it bigger. Let me pick a different color. I consider this singularity here and I zoom in. And what I have, it's a beautiful hyperbolic singularity of the type that we were considering yesterday in the problem session that we could also see as a cotangent lift where the first integral is x time y, okay? Well, uh, we may have, and in this case, okay, what happens is that if you consider the, the, the fiber through, uh, through this point, okay, it's going to be precisely the whole eight figure. But when you consider the orbit, you need to consider the Hamiltonian vector field of F, which coincides with the vector field we saw yesterday in Pau's uh, class. And then what happens is that the orbit of the zero is just a point, okay? So here we are getting uh, in the business of, um, of singular foliations indeed, but not very deeply, okay? Now I say singular foliations and many people in the audience said, oh yeah, Lee algebra, it's not, relax. We are just going to consider uh, really easy uh, singular foliations. But take into account that you can make this as difficult as you want. And if you are one of these people who likes to consider foliation theory, you are in the right place. You could go as crazy as you want and consider all kinds of crazy uh, singular foliations and try to play this game. I will not. I mean, today I want to play this game, but for this kind of singularities, still interesting things happen. So here the orbit is a point 
and the fiber is the eight figure. So you don't have coincidence at the singular points. You don't no longer have coincidence of fiber and um, of fiber and, and singular point. Okay, so let's go on. Well, here I remember what is a quanti uh, what is a connection. What we need to to remember of a connection is that a connection has uh, uh, we are the, uh, we are taking sections of a bundle, okay, and we are doing derivatives in the direction of the manifold of the base. So, in the direction of the base, it acts uh, tensorially, and in the in the, in this other direction, we have this Leibniz rule here. So, it acts like a derivation in one of the of the uh, in in the in one of the components and tensorially on the other. That's what we need to remember. Okay, uh, we already. I mean, I could just skip this this uh, slide. And well, here it's an interesting game. Uh, there is a. I mean, when you work uh, when you work with with uh, with actual problems, you need to take. Uh, you usually start by taking a trivialization if you can. You take a trivialization, some local trivialization of your bundle, and you work with. And you work with a section of this one. And usually in practice, what you do, uh, this connection, okay, once you are, because this connection, okay, you can think of it globally, of course, but uh, the whole purpose of our approach is that the definition of quantization will be a shift theoretical definition. This means that you need to put your hands in computations by uh, by by you by using a kind of check homology. Okay, so check homology is our guide today, and the principle of check homology is that you can do everything with your hands by taking local trivializations. Okay, so these connections, if you if you express it in in local uh, normal forms, and this is the connection to to what uh, to the last class to what Pau was explaining uh, here. We can always write it in this way when I have where I take a potential one form. And let's see what this potential one form can be. Well, here, so you express your nabla x in, the, in this way. Okay. Now, what happens if you take, if you change with another section? And what happens is that you can always change with another section by multiplying by a function. And what happens is that you get this change here. Of connection one, and what's surprising is that you can write this as an exponential, and this is because you're you're assuming that you have an Hermitian bundle, and you're assuming your connection is compatible with Hermitian bundle. Okay, therefore you can really solve this equation. Well, here the f this should be c, sorry, typo, and this should be f, and then you can really find a function solving this equation. So when you change the uh, so the message of this of this slide is first you can do things with your with local computations and second when you change the the when you when you change this uh, section okay then the kind of of change you are you are per, you are doing with respect to the connection is adding a differential of a function okay that's the kind of game you are playing so this means that you can usually take the as connection one form in your actual computations, the Liouville one form that it's convenient for your computation. So you usually take a Liouville one form such that this expression here, it's simplified with respect to your polarization. We'll see this in, a, in an example. So yeah, here I have reserved a space of proofs because uh, even if Kota already assumed that we all know the, I mean, the, the theorem that you can associate a line bundle, okay, a complex line bundle, a medium complex line bundle, whenever you have an integral class, whenever omega, I don't think green is a very, so it's sophisticated enough. Uh, here we go, let me change. I think blue is the right color for this, but first we erase. So what I want to explain again is this integrality condition. 
a little bit, and I want to to I want to explain this. So this condition, remember that we saw in the this is a proposition in in Cota's lecture. that this is equivalent to the existence of this complex like Mandel. But I want to go over this proof for the sake of re re relating, because I think that this uh, is uh, going through the proof, gives some light to the connection of uh, Czech homology and the construction of the line Mandel, okay? So let me remind for this purpose, uh, maybe this is a good color. Okay, let me choose this. So re recall how the connection between the RAM homology, and this is a message I want to particularly send to my students because in Barcelona, unfortunately, we don't learn this in the undergraduate class, but I think in Germany you do. Okay, so what's the connection of the RAM homology and Czech homology? You'll see a lot of Czech homology uh, in the next uh, lecture by Paul. Okay, you'll see indeed a construction, uh, I mean, a problem you uh, solve using Czech homology approach. But let me, let me remind how this works, how you start with a homology class in the RAM complex and you associate, Pau is there, hello Pau and you associate a check, uh, a, a, an element of the check class. Well, you start by taking a good cover. A good cover, it means everything you want. At least what you want to have is contractible intersections. Okay, then you know that because you have a class in H2, this is going to be a closed form, right? So whenever you have, you, in, in any of these guys, you can write a sub pi, okay? As the restriction of omega to the open set u, u sub i. And then there, you can really write this. And this is just because of Poincare lemma. Okay? Then what happens on the intersection? Check homology six triple intersections. So to go to triple intersections, we should go to double intersections. Well, what happens when you are in the intersection of two different u sub i and u sub j? Of course, for u sub j, you would also have an equation like this. Now I'm going to do something which is going to make this bigger to gain space, great. Okay. Then on this intersection, what I have is that dBi equals to dBj because we are on the intersection. Therefore, this means that I have an element, okay, that I have indeed a function on the intersection. This is a function. So that you can write Bi minus Bj equals differential of Cij. And now you play the weak game of going to triple intersection, which is a lot of fun. Then on triple inter intersection, you have these guys Cij for every two elements, but you also have, you can check because of the intersection property that such a condition is satisfied. Okay, this is satisfied because you have uh, because you have this condition. Okay, and then you look at the intersections, and we are happy because this means that if you take the 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 function this function is constant. And this allows us 
to define a cohomology class, this defines a cohomology class in H2, in principle with coefficients on R, by looking this check approach of, you know, do everything with your hands, uh, split in open sets with contractible intersections, and go on with your life. Now, we are in business, why? Because we just saw that now what I need to do is I need to put my, this is general. This is what happens when you go from the RAM homology and you have a, a class in the RAM homology to check homology. Now I want to play this game with a particular class, with a particular class of omega. Now let's play this game in a different color, why not? We have infinite colors here. What about this? Okay, good. Let's play this game for omega, for the class of omega. For the class of omega, we have an additional, an additional information we just, just saw in the last slide. What we know is that we can write omega as the differential of theta i's, okay, from the last slide. And then on the intersection, we could write that theta i minus theta j is the differential of a logarithm of a function that now I'm going to call g i j. And indeed, we saw that this function from the previous slide is connected indeed to a change, uh, to a change of, to let's say, to a transformation, to a transformation of the line band, okay? Because this is what we were doing. We were changing the section. Okay, so now what I want to say is that now consider the churn class, as we saw before, in the class of cota, we take two pi omega, this class, okay? And now we play this game and we send this to C on H2, check commodity. Of course, the RAM, the RAM theorem is telling us that this is an isomorphism, okay? It's just a matter of changing the glasses, how you look at the computation of commodity. And the glasses of check commodity are the right glasses for today for, for today's class. So now what I what I do, I have an extra information, which is that the, the CIJs here indeed are logarithms. And this information comes from the last slide. Okay, it comes really from the Hermitian condition, okay, which I didn't get too far into this, but you can believe that this is true. Therefore, in our case, we have that the CIJK, which is this uh, function here, it reads like two pi i. Well, there is a two pi i that you can normalize this. The logarithm of GIJ plus the logarithm of GJK plus the logarithm of GKI. Okay. But this GI, this uh, function here from the former uh, discussion are indeed transition functions on your line bundle. Therefore, they have to satisfy a cocycle condition. And the cocycle condition is the following one. that the composition of the three has to be the identity, okay? And the identity is one because I have a line bundle, okay? So therefore, in particular, if you look at this cycle condition, okay, time for reds. Let's first erase this.
Now you plug this condition and you look at the log of this equation here. This is telling you exactly that you have a condition of type exponential of two pi. Cijk. Well, here we have the disgrace that I of the sub index equals the imaginary part. I think we can live with that. Okay. If you write a paper with Victor Gillum, you cannot live with it. But uh, let's assume that we, we can uh, live with that. But I think that here we get uh, something of this sort. Therefore, we get that the Cij, Cijk, well, because we have divided by i, indeed, we, I don't have this i here. In my convention, I have divided by i. Okay, never mind. So here we have that these guys has to be an element. This has to belong to z. Otherwise, this equation doesn't make sense because this equation, sorry, I didn't finish writing the equation. Well, this equation, okay, let me. Let me put an i here and forget this i here. I think it's more clear. And I have this equation equal to one, okay? And then the condition is that Caj belongs to z. In order, in order to have that this equals to one, this function here has to be a function on z, okay? I could have normalized this two pi i at the beginning and forget about them. Okay, here I think I have normalized somewhere and no, not on the, on the other way. But you understand what I mean. Here, the key point between the, the general computation of looking at as a, as a class in the RAM homology and in Czech homology, if I, if I look, if I play this game for the symplectic class, it turns out that because the change, the local change of, of, of this theta of the connection one form, can be done in terms of a, of, a logarithm, of a logarithmic function, and this is because of the median condition that allows you to write this. Then I can, I can write this very equation in this way, and therefore this only makes sense because of the cosical condition if this guy here is in Z. But this guy here represents the class, the class of CAJK, it's a class in H2. Therefore, this tells you that this class really belongs to Z. Okay, so I have proved one of the implications. Okay, I have proved that if you have the line bundle, then this class has to be integral. I could have finished saying, well, this is the term class, go home, this is an, an integral, an integer. But uh, of course, you can reverse. I have done one implication, but you can reverse. You can always reconstruct your line bundle from the transition functions. And that's the power of uh, check homology in your hands, really. So that's the kind of computations, indeed, that you end up doing when you compute also shift homology, because you always need to cover your manifold with a good cover and do this kind of computations. And I thought that, well, this was uh, stated in the, in the former class, but I thought it, it, it would be useful for you to have the proof. OK, so I have done one proof. Now I can go on with my talk normally. So I'm saved. I have done one proof. Maybe I will do a second proof. I was planning to do a second proof. We'll see because, okay. Now what's the definition of bohr sommerfeld leaves in this, in this business? Uh, okay, we saw this in the former uh, lecture. A, a bohr sommerfeld leaf is a leaf of the polarization admitting a global flat section. Uh, as I said, the curvature, you have to look at curvature as an abstraction to have this condition for free. And I'm going to uh, do the, the simplest possible example on the cotangent bundle. Let me play in the cotangent bundle. This is not good now, it's a good choice. If we play on S1, I can think of this as the cotangent bundle of S1. And I play here, I take omega of this sort, Okay, this is my omega, okay? And I can think that the, this omega can be written as d t d theta. Now you may think, 
is this the right connection one for? What I was trying to, to stress before is that there is no concept of connection one for. Uh, if you do, if you take another representative, you, you can take as connection one form, this one form here. This is what I say, the Liouville one form. What happens if you change the Liouville one form? In practice, what you are doing is to take a different section of your bundle. That's what that's the message of the well, not the former computation, but the, the previous slide. Okay. When you change what, what I call the the, the sec unitary section or whatever, you, you change the section of your bundle, you take a different one, you are multiplying by a function. And this function then shows up here as a, well, by taking the logarithm, it's not exactly the same function, uh, but by adding another differential of another function, so taking another representative, you are indeed uh, changing the trivializing section. That's what I say. Okay, so here I take as polarization the partial of theta. So you may think of this, well, you, well this could be a picture of the cotangent bundle of this one. Okay, we will, you, you'll go over this example in the class of, uh, of problem sessions. Okay, and I may think of this as, you know, as a cylinder foliated by these S1s here. And I look at here, the polarization is this foliation, this foliation by S1s. So that's the polarization. Okay, the connection, then the, set, the, the, the differential equation given by this section, I can write it as such. Okay. And now what I want to solve is the differential equation, this equal to zero, okay? This means that I need to solve this differential equation. So I need to find a section such that, that I have this, but here X is partial of theta. So the differential equation that I have is partial of theta S I. Now what I do, if I do, this is the, the contraction of the connection one form that I have here. I have it here. I want to change the color. This is the connection one form that I'm taking. Okay. So what I need to do just is this alpha theta is T theta, differential of theta. Now I need to pair it against theta. Therefore I get T. Okay. So what I have is ITS. That's the differential equation I need to solve. But that's an easy differential equation. Solutions of this, of this equation are sections of the type, well, here I put a sigma S, never mind. These have to be, this is the differential equation that I have, and the solutions have to be of exponential type, okay? So, and then I need to play with constants. I have. I have an exponential type uh, solution, but I can think of this as a time dependent, uh, trivial uh, differential equation. Therefore, the solutions are going to be also time dependent. So I get the solutions of this sort. That are the, that's are the sections. Whoop. What is this rule doing here? Go away. What is this rule? Okay. I don't have no control on my on my computer. Apparently, I added a rule here that it's going to stay forever. Go away. Okay, I need to go to to control my my computer. Well, never mind. We are here, so we have this solution. So these are the solutions to your differential equation. Do you agree with this? Look. Okay. Uh, you are convinced that this is correct. Look, okay. Now you agree with me that if I if I go out around, uh, if I take now t, okay, t is uh, I have a, the coordinate theta goes in the uh, from zero to two pi. So if I go if I vary theta from zero to two pi, what happens? Do I go back to the initial place, Luke? What do you think for any t? Unmute yourself. I mean, well, this is the, the danger of putting the camera that I see you. Okay. Yeah, this is the risk of the, being the only person that turns its camera on. But uh, yeah, I, I like this condition that t has to be a multiple of two pi. That, that's exactly. really necessary. 
Exactly. You need this condition here. You agree with me? Otherwise, this is not well defined when you go back, right? So yes. that's exactly the condition that we need in order to have that this section make sense, okay? Uh, for for in order to have this section to make sense along a board summer for leaves, which is one of these circles, I need to be able to go back to the same function. And this only happens as Luke is observing when you have this integral condition here. Yeah, well, I could, good. again, I have this two pi here, whatever, you understand what I mean. I need to have that this T here has to be indeed uh, this uh, two pi K, okay? So I have two pi times an integer condition. This is telling me that if I look at this cylinder, the number of bohr sommerfeld leaves, it's going to be discrete on this cylinder. I could even mark them in green, okay? So that's an example, but this is more than an example. And Luke knows this because yesterday we saw, well, you, don't, you think you don't know it, but you know it. Yesterday we saw, because of the arnold uville theorem, okay, we saw that if you have a, a, an integrable system and you're in the neighborhood of a Liouville torus, you're, you're, you, you can write your integrable system as a product of these models. Indeed, and that's the wise thing. So indeed, if you know this in dimension two, you know this in dimension two n, when you have, when your polarization is given by a regular Fourier, And that's thanks, thanks to the power of arnold liouville theorem, okay? I'm saying a lot of things here. I'm using arnold liouville theorem and I'm using the observation before that you can always take as connection one form, the Liouville one, because if you change, by adding a differential of a function, this is equivalent to changing the trivializing section, okay? So we are in good shape. We have proved a theorem indeed. We have proved, indeed almost proved this theorem by Gilliam and Stammer, okay? We have proved this theorem of Gilliam and Stammer whenever the base, it's an, it's uh, so uh, here Gilliam and Stammer proved a more general statement for regular vibrations with compact glyphs over a simply connected base. This can be any manifold which is simply connected, for instance, a stew. Okay. That's the thing. Okay. So that's the kind of problem that we could uh, we could uh, have. Okay, so we could have a base which is not uh, R2. So when we have, let me recall, I'm writing too much, that let me write here that when we have an integrable system, we are considering that the base is Euclidean space of dimension M, so. Okay, so in the case in which the base is Euclidean, the action angle coordinates allows us to prove that the number of bohr sommerfeld leaves is discrete because we can just try to extend to the maximum. Well, it requires a, a little bit of work because these action angle coordinates are not global. They, are, they exist in a neighborhood. So you need to make a kind of check argument, but more or less it works. So, uh, so this theorem of Gilliam and Stammer is telling me that this is always true whenever you have also a regular vibration, not only uh, the case of the moment map. And the difference is that here you may have regular vibrations over a simply connected base without any, uh, you don't need to have singularities. You can, for instance, take the product of a T2, okay, with S2 project to, East, to S2, okay, and then, this would give you a regular vibration without singularities. You have singularities when the target is, is exactly Rn. Okay, so in the most sophisticated way, case in which you consider a regular vibration over a simply connected base, then the bohr sommerfeld for leaves is given by the values of the this F1, Fn are action angle coordinates. So you take global action order coordinates on B, 
these actual angular coordinates make sense also for vibrations, not only for, for interval systems, because you can always define them in the same way as uh, Miner defined them, which is that if you are in a neighborhood of a Lagrangian fiber, you can always write omega as the differential of alpha, okay? And then you may integrate uh, by taking a basis of the homology, you may integrate uh, alpha over generators of the homology, gamma i, okay? And this gives you the PIs and the definition makes sense also. Okay, and then in the case of toric manifolds, this vase is just the image of the moment map. And that's a good way to think of, of this vase. In general, I, well, I have reserved here a space of proofs and voila, I even started to make the picture that if you want to prove this theorem of, of Gilamin Stenberg, indeed one, one, I mean, in the case of, of uh, interable systems, you can do this uh, with your hand. I mean, you can do this very easily using the arnold Liouville theorem, okay? But you can also do it in general with this picture. You take two points that are on the bohr sommerfeld uh, set, so P and Q are belong to the bohr sommerfeld set. And then you, you what you do is to take a path BT that connects the point P to the point Q. And then you take a generator of the homology here, gamma I of P. And here you take a generator of the homology, gamma I of Q. And then what this generates, well, here I'm assuming that the fibers are toric. A good question is if you have a vibration that is not given by an interval system over a simply connected case base, do you also have that the fibers are tori? Yeah, you also have this. And it, you can prove this very similarly to the proof we did using, indeed, using an action. And you can also look at this at uh, here I'm following Guillermina Stenberg uh, paper, which uh, it has a title like Gulf and Settling Systems, whatever. But this is, they have some preliminaries, which holds not only for the health and settling systems. And this is in the Journal of Functional Analysis in 83. Okay. So I'm following their proof because their proof is very simple. I take two of these uh, fibers, okay, over the base. And here, what I have is a, in, in this is a surface, it's a cylinder, where the boundary of this cylinder, this cylinder is called gamma I. And the boundary of the cylinder is just uh, gamma I P, gamma I Q minus gamma I P. Here I have an issue with the, with the orientation on the boundary. And I need to, to recall this because I'm going to use Stokes theorem. So I'm going to change color. Sorry, when is the vibration regular again? What's the regular? Yeah, I'm assuming uh, uh, that's, that's the assumption. Okay. No, sorry. But, what's the definition? Okay, that, that you have a vibration, just that all the all the fibers are regular. All the fibers have the same dimension. Okay. Oh, okay. We say it's singular fiber. So yeah, here, so I, I may consider, for instance, an example of this would be just to consider a product of T two times S two yeah, and project so on S two. Regular means nowhere singular. Nowhere singular. Exactly. Very the good. definition of regular is nowhere singular. Of course, this is impossible if the target space is the Euclidean space, you cannot escape the singularities, okay? But let's say it's good to keep in mind that, uh, you know, a perfect world without singularities exists somewhere, but then you need to sacrifice your, your base. Your base cannot be the RN, RN, has to be something else. Okay, but the proof works, uh, this proof I'm providing works for, for general, for the, for the two cases. If you are, if you are considering uh, uh, the set where the action angle coordinates are well defined. Okay, so uh, here what I what I do is the following: I take omega. Uh, maybe I'm going to change the color. I take omega.
okay? And I integrate over gamma i. And here is one I, I'm happy to apply Stokes theorem in the most basic format. So theorem tells me that I need to omega. I can write it as the differential of alpha. Here I'm just using my sign theorem. And I can apply alpha, okay, over gamma i of q minus gamma i of p. But this is just the integral of gamma. There is uh, this orientation issues. Sorry, this is a, a gamma i of q, correct? Gamma i of q, okay, minus alpha gamma i of p. And this is just the definition of the action uh, function, okay, which we called, uh, I mean, we called pi in our language, but here I'm going to use the language of the statement, which is called f1 fn, not to confuse with the piece, okay? So I'm going to call this fi of q minus fi of p. Okay, I have such a, a relation, but uh, then I'm going to use out of the sudden, I need to use some equation that I will not prove. This is an equation I'm going to consider something which is called the monodromy matrix. The monodromy matrix are important in this business. How are they given? If I, I have a connection, so I have parallel transport and this parallel transport transports a one dimensional fiber over a one dimensional fiber. Therefore, the monodromy is just a linear transformation in dimension one. That's a constant, a complex constant. You agree with me? So I take the monodromy matrix, okay? And this is called the monodromy matrix. The monodromy is the transformation, is precisely monodromy, is the, the linear transformation that you get going after parallel transport and coming back to the same point. So you take, this is the monodromy at the point Q, okay? By taking the transport along gamma I, okay? And then, uh, well, I'm going to use this formula. There is a, a formula, this was done by Koston, full respect. So I'm going to use it, okay? So, That's my rabbit on the hat that I use this equation. And I believe this is done by Costan. And you can find a proof on this, on this famous, uh, wonderful paper where you can also find a very complete proof uh, that uh, the proof that I sketched before is the proof of Costan indeed, of the existence of the line bundle. And this is a, an old paper that you can find inside a book that you would never think of, uh, this, this paper, foundational paper of Costan. Okay, so now what I do is to use here, well, sorry, here I have used the, this is omega. Now what I need to do is to plug this guy here. I plug this guy here and what I get is the following. What I get is that the monodromy matrix of Q exponential of two pi i f i q equals the monodromy matrix of p exponential two pi e f j f j of p. Okay, I have this equality here. And now I'm going to play the clever person. If I assume that P is on the Sommerfeld set, the Bohr Sommerfeld set, what does it mean? It means that in this, along this uh, Bohr Sommerfeld set, the, 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 the section is globally defined, is well defined along this set. This means that the monodromy, that when I come back, Luke agree with, agrees with me. This is wonderful to, to see that Luke agrees with me, that when you come back, you have the identity matrix, right? So you will agree with me that if I'm on the Borsomer for leaf, I need to have that this matrix is the identity, that this matrix is one, okay? 
Then now you think, okay? And I also can assume, for instance, that f sub pi of, uh, of f sub j, f sub pi, I have f i, sorry, I, I, have, I have done a mess here. I don't have j's, I have f i q and this is f i p, sorry. Two i's here. Okay, I'm on the same, uh, sorry, huh? this is an I. So I can assume that FIP equals zero because I can assume anything. I, I just move, I just make a translation on the base and I normalize at zero. With these conditions here, for this equation to make sense, and this is a mental exercise that is good to have after a coffee, okay? You can only have that for this to make sense, you need to have that MIQ equals one, which means that this is on the Borsomer false set. And then you have the similar equation as I had before. You have something like this. This only makes sense if this guy here is also an integer. Indeed, what you need to have is that the difference is an integer. And once you set one of the, of the images here on this uh, projection, because these guys project down to the base, Okay, this projects down to f i of p, and this projects projects down to f. Uh, sorry, yeah, f i of q. And once you project to the base, okay, what happens is that if one is integer, then the difference is integer. Therefore, the other one is integer. Thus, the image of the Borsheimer false set, okay, is just the latest, the the the, the points on the on the on the on the lattice on R m on Z m. You agree with me? That's the identification of the version. And that's a beautiful, beautiful proof that maybe we don't need it, we don't need it for interval systems. We could we could live without. We should take a cover, we should maximize the action angle coordinate. It's a bit of a of a stress, but this proof is neat, it's clean, and you need two ingredients: the Stokes theorem and a magic formula by by custom. We couldn't do it without this formula. And we have learned something else. We, we have learned that there is something called monodromy matrix and that you can identify the Borsheimer leaves as elements with a monodromy matrix e equal to one, which is one. Okay, let's go on. Life is so, short and I have seven minutes. Okay, Luke, you have a question. Well, we also need that the base is connected, right? Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. The base is connected and simply connected. That's what we yes. need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are completely right. Thank you. It's fantastic to have somebody who is awake before 12. I'm not this kind of person, uh, let me tell you, but uh, <laughs> I'm doing my best. Okay, and now it's when I answer the question that uh, that Stefan was doing to, to Kota. What happens on CP2? Okay, I'm very glad it looks like I did this a slide in the, in the, during the coffee break, but no, I had it before. I'm going to answer the question that Stefan was doing. This is the image of the CP2. Well, yesterday I had it here because, well, this is the image of CP2 with the convention of plus one on the moment map. And I usually do the other convention, but never mind. This is CP2. The, the image of CP2, it's a triangle for us. Okay. So I want to clarify what happens with the singularities. Okay. If you consider uh, CP2, and you consider here, okay, this action. This is an action of a torus. CP2 is dimension four. And this is an action of a two torus. Indeed, it's toric, okay? And this action, you can check uh, that it's effective. The action is here. And the image of the moment map is precisely given by these guys here. So what's going to happen is that any point inside in the in in the interior, okay, every every point inside the interior, it's going to be regular, and the points on the boundary are going to be singular, okay. But I can, uh, I'm okay. And what do what did we learn from the previous theorem that the Borsheimer fan leaves are going to be points here on the. Ah, uh, okay want to erase this. So if we take just the points that are the integral points inside here, this identifies 
the Bohr Sommerfeld uh, leaves in the interior. What happened with the exterior points? Okay, let me let me let me find out. And it's good to have in mind this idea that you have that you have a toric manifold and that the image is a is a Dalsan sample polytope. Case of vibrations. Okay, what I want to do is finally to give my definition of quantization. The definition of quantization is the following. Indeed, you could give a naive definition saying that you quantize the systems counting more summer for leaves. That's an okay definition. But I want to, I cannot live without cohomology. Okay, this is something that my students know. So I want to identify this more summer fall count as a cohomology. Indeed, how do you do this? Well, uh, you define, and, and this is the idea of Costan, is to define the cohomology quantization, the quantization of the manifold, just as the shift cohomology, so cohomology in all possible degrees, over, uh, over J, okay? The shift, this is the shift of flat sections. Why I take a shift? Because there are no global flat sections. If there are no global flat sections, but I have local flat sections, I may take the shift. So I take the shift of se flat sections and I can uh, consider this cohomology. Okay, this shift, if you think about this, only leaves, makes sense, we have seen this, it, it leaves, okay, it makes sense over the more summer for leaves. So indeed what happens at the end of the day is that, is that this cohomology groups are just concentrated on half the dimension of the manifold. And indeed, it's a theorem of Sniatinsky that, uh, that in the case, in the regular case, this coin, coincides with the Bohr-Sommerfeld. Uh, Bohr-Sommerfeld. How can you prove this? Well, it looks like this model that I was, oh, I don't know what I need. It looks like this model that I was describing, regular Bohr-Sommerfeld. That's a theorem. That's the theorem of Sniatinsky. Okay. And how do you do this? How do you prove this? It looks like, you know, uh, the regular the regular model I was describing in action angle coordinates uh, in dimension two of the cotangent bundle should be an okay model in dimension two. And what happens in higher dimension? Well, you have shift cohomology, you have QNET formula. Can you come up with a kind of product argument to conclude? Indeed, this is true, okay? Well, this is exactly what I said, that the, the cohomology is, this is the formula I was writing before. This is what I just said, that this lives in dimension 2n. But what is this cohomology? How do you compute cohomology? And there are two types of persons. There is no other type with cohomology. You are the guy who likes, uh, indeed, this is a bit wrong, but let me, let me make big assertions at the end of my talks. You are maybe the guy who likes uh, who likes exact sequences, or maybe you are the the guy who likes check homology. There are two types of people, but these two kind of people have something in common. They all like diagram chasing. Who doesn't like a good diagram chasing? Okay, diagram chasing is a method that makes you believe that you are like Indiana Jones. You want to compute a cohomology and you are Indiana Jones. You never touch the base. You just jump from one liana to another liana and you, you go on your life without <laughs> indeed just computing part of the cohomology and using algebra, com indeed homological algebra to give you the final answer. Okay, in the same case, there are two people, there are two approaches to this cohomology. The, the first one, is the approach using exact resolutions. Uh, this approach is very good for theoretical purposes, but it's not very efficient for actual computations. And the idea is the following. If you consider the polarization, it's a foliation. Therefore, you have the perfect uh, complex associated to a foliation. Whenever you have a foliation, you just take the Durham complex and you restrict the derivatives in the direction of the foliation. And this gives you, uh, this gives you a complex that, it's, uh, that it satisfies the, that it's a complex. So the differential of P is zero. And the surprise is that the cohomology of this complex is indeed the, the foliated cohomology. 
So people who like foliations, I don't know if there are, I saw Sylvain Lavo yesterday, I don't know if he's around, but if you like foliations, this is a good place for you. If you like contour examples, this is a good place for you. Okay. Then, uh, well, you may think that you want to compute the, the cohomology of flat sections, and this cohomology is indeed, you can compute it from the cohomology of the foliation just by twisting the resolution. You have a fine resolution here, which is given by, by, by differential functions, which are constant along the leaves of your foliation. And you can think that you can twist this to produce another complex. That's very beautiful when you see it in films, but it's not op operational. That's a very nice idea. And it's, an, it's the idea of the RAM theorem that all the ways that you compute are okay. But this is a, a good way to put, it's, it's a good uh, way to put this in your, head, in your head somewhere. It's Pablo is connected. Pablo is one of these persons, one of my students who likes to have this categorically. So categorically, this is a perfect idea, but computationally, you need to do check homology. So we have a computation kit. I'm going to stay, I'm going to extend myself maybe three more minutes, where you have a Meyer formula, a QNOT formula, Meyer Vietoris, and this is going to be in the exercise class tomorrow. And for general Lagrangian foliations, as I said, if you are a person like me who likes foliations, this is a good place for you because you can do all kind of computation. By the way, when you compute the shift cohomology that gives you the quantization, you in the limit when omega equals zero, you get foliated cohomology. So if you like foliated cohomology, you may think of quantization as a door to compute this foliated cohomology. I did this in the past with my friend, uh, Fran Presas. We computed the shift cohomology of foliations that are not uh, vibrations, okay? For instance, take the torus, this is the typical example we put to our, our students. We take the torus and you take the rational slope on the torus. Okay, well, this is not even a submanifold. So you may expect very strange things coming out of here. And it happens. It happens that first the quantization is always infinite dimensional, which means that cost and proof, uh, cost and definition of geometric quantization of shift cohomology uh it's not uh let's say it's not uh it's not infallible it fails it fails when you take a very straight foliation of course like this one and in the limit case of foliated cohomology you get a finite dimensional if the rational measure is finite but we are used to for instance to Liouville numbers where half infinite irrational uh measure so in that case, it's, in, it's infinite. So if you think of quantization as a perfect representation, this is not a perfect representation. So here's the definition of cost and phase. And uh, I, I, this is something that I included in my slides, but I knew I was going to leave this as an exercise because in order to do, this is the proof you can use the computation kit to prove the theorem of Zyatisky with your hands, with the information you have now, and this is in my, well, this is something we did with uh, my friend, uh, Fran Presas, but this is a good exercise, but it uses uh, two computations that uh, tomorrow, these two computations you will see tomorrow in PAL. So I, they, they are in my slides for you, for you to have this computation, that, but PAL has to do the preliminaries for you to understand this computation. But this is a funny computation I invite you to look at. Let me finish. Let me finish this by going back to the to the case to the quantization of toric manifolds and answering the question of a Stefan. What happens if you put in the regular case conclusion only the integral points go to the quantization and you can you can change these points using shift cohomology. Paul will do this tomorrow. I I, I didn't exhibit uh, this computation. I think I did enough shift cohomology with this proof of uh, the Weiss theorem, which tells you that if you have integral class, you have the you have this line bundle. Uh, 
So uh, tomorrow the, the, at 1.30 in the class of PAU, you will see the chief theoretical computation that you need to prove Sniatisky's theorem with your hands, with this computation. And then the answer by the question of, uh, of uh, Stefan is the following, that in the CP2 case, that's a toric manifold, the bohr sommerfeld that are on the boundary that are singular, you may have bohr sommerfeld uh, singular. It makes sense. But they don't show up in the sheaf computation. OK? This is a result. This is the thesis of Bar Hamilton, indeed. And that's, uh, that's very nice. So they don't show up in the computation. And well, the key point to understand is why they don't show up in the computation. It's a local computation of this sort and understanding the differential equation and understanding that these are the only solutions. Indeed, it's the same computation I did before. The difference is that now the coordinates are not global coordinates, but you do a change to polar coordinates. OK, once you do the change to polar coordinates, formally the equation is the same. But these coordinates, in principle, don't make sense at zero. The miracle is that even if the coordinates don't make sense at zero, the solutions are extend to zero. OK, this proves that the, you don't count the elliptic points in the boundary of CP2. You don't count because these solutions vanish at zero. OK, therefore, you don't see them in the computation. What else? What other singularities you may have? Mm. You may have hyperbolic singularities and focus focus singularities. So, I, I'm finishing. Focus focus singularities, I'll do tomorrow. And maybe I'll do tomorrow also the, the hyperbolic case to go a little bit more, more smooth. So I'm going to finish here. So I, I'm going to stop in this classification in which I'm going to say, this is done. This is done. I have I mean, a bit click. I will do this tomorrow. And tomorrow, I will also look at this singularity. These singularities are important. They are focus, focus type because they appear in semi-toric systems. Semi-toric systems are very popular nowadays. OK? Well, we saw it yesterday. They are not only popular, but if you take a spherical pendulum, why would you like a spherical pendulum? Why not? OK? Then you have this, this, this semi-toric singularity. So we better know how to compute it. So tomorrow, what is the plan? I'm sorry because I was a bit quick towards the end of my talk. That Pau will do a shift, uh, a check homology computation of the of the cylinder, and with this computation, you can reprove the theorem of Zniatisky just using Kuhner formula and Meyer Vietnamese. Okay, and that remains an exercise indeed. Maybe maybe Pau will have time to comment. Pau will will has an exciting computation to show you. When you have what happens if you don't have an uh, if you now try to put the singularity on the symplectic form? Interesting things happen. Tomorrow we will see what happens when in these two cases, the check homology, and what happens if you consider a sphere such that the area form explodes on the equation on the equator. Why would you like that? Imagine that you have a manifold with boundary. This happens. And these manifolds are called B manifolds, not because they were born in Barcelona, but because Melrose worked out cal uh, the B calculus precisely to do a proof of the index theorem on manifolds with boundary. And tomorrow, be prepared for this exciting session where you will see focus, focus singularities and B symplectic manifolds. I have to say that we will see little of B symplectic manifolds because I, I will have to also to explain the the hyperbolic case. But I think, Pau, uh, I mean, I would point to stop now. I'm sorry for the delay, because you have enough material for tomorrow class. The exercises of the class of tomorrow, indeed, they are on session four of the notes. But then you will see that it says shift cohomology. It means shift cohomology. We didn't write it properly, Pau. It means shift cohomology for which kind of shift cohomology? Well, shift cohomology. Uh, for uh, quantization. So this shift is the shift of flat sections, OK? So it says something like shift cohomology of the cylinder, and it means shift cohomology of the cotangent model of S1. That computation I did, uh, Paul will do it 
uh, but using Czech homology approach. And Czech homology, as I said, you can be a person who likes uh, exact sequence or you can be a Czech homology person. But at the end of the day, you are the same person because you need to jump from one computation to the other, like Indiana Jones, okay, using the five lemma or using your favorite tools from homological algebra. And, and the idea of shift homology is you compute global from local. Okay, and uh, now my computer knows I need to stop. This is amazing, this is great. So I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, and that's the end. Thank you very much for your talk. You're moving. <laughs> an effect of time dilation you are moving so fast that you also uh, okay the good news is that you have the slides on the for on the other questions some qu there's room for quick questions okay there will be certainly during the exercise session thank you very much okay. There is a question apparently by, yeah, by Angelo, Angelos, no? You have my a name question. Is, my name is Camilo. It, it's just ah, Camilo. Ah, okay. <laughs> I don't know. You have K. Uh, I don't know. Sorry, Camilo. Yeah, I, I don't know how to work out my 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 name here. Um, I, I just wanted to know. So if if, if the the quantization is counting integral points in this in the moment map. Um, yes. What does this tell me about well, simple examples such as the sphere? If I make it larger, like why should I think making large like a larger sphere gives me a different quantization? That's that's very interesting. That's a very interesting point. I mean, so if you increase, so the the image that Camilo is having is the image of the sphere, okay, uh, the two sphere, okay, and you take here uh, in the case of the two sphere, the image are just the moment map just goes, let's take the case of the sphere, this is two dimensional, and the moment map just gives you the, the integral point of the line. So the, the remember, however, that you need to have that the class is integral. So beware when you increase this thing, you can increase it also in a quantum way. You can only increase the, the volume because it's, it, the class is just the volume, it's just the integral of the area. So this area has to be integral. This means that when you increase, okay, you have a change in the scale of the points, but this change is produced, uh, let's say, in a coherent way, okay, with the change that you have there on the integral points. You see what I mean, Camilo? Because this integrality condition is putting you this constraint. You understand? And in the two-dimensional case, the class is just the integral, it's just the area. Is the integral of omega over the of the sphere, so it's just the integral. The, so the the sphere can only increase just jumping, doing integer jumps. Okay, so it's totally compatible. I agree with you. Yes, thank you. Okay, so then let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Maybe I will put this, uh, maybe I will give this to, to Severin so he, up, he updates the slides with the comments so people can also follow what I wrote if you want. Okay. okay. I don't know where is Severin. He contacted me yesterday. I don't see him. Okay. He's there sitting on the. Okay. Thanks, Severin. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, now there will be a very, very short break of one minute or so until the next talk.